So uh, as you get more options, uh, as in many cancers like renal cell cancer, uh, the question of sequencing comes up. You know, is it better to give A before B or B before A? And then a new drug, C, comes along, where does that fit in? So in the case of an ALK rearranged lung cancer uh, patient, we've had crizotinib, a fantastic drug on the market uh, for years now. We have next generation drugs now available, approved in the second line space, electinib and seritinib right now. We have seen data that seritinib and electinib could have value in the first line setting as well, although uh, technically not approved strategies at this point, uh, although we expect that to happen hopefully soon. And so the question is, how do you sequence medications? I think right now the, uh, the approach that's available to us is everybody gets crizotinib at diagnosis, and then you make a choice of whether to get electinib or seritinib. Uh, I don't know that there's one wrong or right strategy there, except that you need to get one of those drugs. Um, now, if one of those drugs moves into an earlier line setting, then the sequence changes, although it's unlikely somebody's going to start with a drug like electinib and then move on to crizotinib, um, but hopefully we'll have other drugs, and many of them are in development now, as next options for patients. And of course, there's always chemotherapy. We are blessed with the number of different TKI in this era. We have both the first generation and second generation. So we come with the natural question is that, which come, should come first. So there have been investigations to look into this question. There is the J. Addict study, which actually randomized control study comparing anatinib with crisotinib. The report is that demonstrated that there is actually improvement, significant improvement in the progression-free survival. However, the study sample size is very small, and also we have to wait for the global addict study, which may likely come out next year, to decide whether actually anatinib is superior to the crisotinib. But then when you have this kind of sequencing question, you come to the other question is the fact that if someone was given the second generation TKI in the first line, would crisotinib work? So far, there's have been very few reports uh, in this regard, and the chance is that it may not work that way. So people may actually come for the logical induction saying, why don't we give it the uh, crisotinib first and then follow with the second generation? So which is the optimal sequence? It remains debatable. There's now data that's emerged from a number of different groups reporting on different resistance mechanisms that emerge to second generation inhibitors like seritinib, electinib, and brigatinib. And we see that in about one half of cases of patients who have relapsed on a second generation inhibitor, they have developed a new ALK resistance mutation. And the spectrum and the type of ALK resistance mutation that develops very much depends on the second generation inhibitor that was used. Each of these drugs has a distinct chemical structure and this leads to selection of different resistance mutations um, depending on what the ALK inhibitor was. This is very important information because some second generation inhibitors are active against certain mutations while others are not. Um, and so as an example, for electinib-treated pati uh, patients, a common mutation that emerges is I1171. Um, it can be I1171 N, T, or S. Um, and this mutation is very resistant to electinib, but very sensitive to seritinib. And so this would be an example where um, understanding the resistance mechanism that emerged on one second generation inhibitor, electinib, would actually guide us toward choosing yet another second generation inhibitor, seritinib. I would say similarly, if uh, we had a patient who relapsed on electinib and now we found the G1202R mutation, which is actually quite common after failure on a second generation inhibitor, that would be a reason not to pick seritinib because it's not going to be active against G1202R, but instead to pick a third generation inhibitor like lorlatinib, which has demonstrated activity. So in fact, knowing the mutation status and the sensitivity resistance profiles of each of these drugs is really important for tailoring subsequent therapies for ALK positive patients. Most ALK positive patients um, either have a never smoking history or maybe a minimal smoking history. We know that ALK rearrangement is, and ROS1 rearrangements are typically, uh, these are not smoking related cancers. 
Um, and so what we've seen over the years from, uh, I would say, anecdotal institutional experience, but more importantly from the large trials of immunotherapies, is that uh, never smoking patients or patients with um, likely minimal uh, mutational burden really have the lowest chance of responding to immunotherapy, specifically checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab and nivolumab. In our own institutional experience, uh, we have never had an ALK positive patient actually respond um, to a single agent uh, checkpoint inhibitor like nivolumab or pembrolizumab. And when we've looked further at these patients' tumors, what we found is that for patients who had uh, ALK positive lung cancer and had received, for example, prior crizotinib or in, you know, any prior ALK inhibitors, that while some of those tumors may have expressed the marker PDL1, there really were no tumors that had any um, sign of both PDL1 and inflammation. So these are really what we call non-inflamed tumors. The immune system just does not seem to recognize these tumors. And I think that is the underlying reason for why we really don't see responses when ALK positive patients are treated with immunotherapy. So I would say right now, in terms of how we approach patients with advanced ALK or ROS1 positive lung cancer, we of course like to use our most active therapies first. That would include the targeted therapies, the first, second, third generation inhibitors that we have. That would include chemotherapy, particularly pemetrexid-based chemotherapy. And while immunotherapy is technically an option for patients who have received prior standard therapies, we tend to um, use immunotherapy much less commonly in these subgroups of patients.